This episode is brought to you by Communications Training for Coffee Teams, a new Mapper Forward workshop tailored to get your team communicating more confidently to improve general mental health as well as business profitability. Click the link in the show notes for further details. Welcome to the Daily Coffee Pro by Mapper Forward Friends. I'm your host, Lee Safar, and this is episode two of our five part series with the wonderful George Howe. George, we spent the last episode talking about prioritizing the coffee producer and in today, today's episode, we're going to talk about the trends in the coffee industry. What are the trends in the coffee industry that are perhaps capturing your attention? I, d- I don't want to say um, that you're loving or you're not loving. I'm going to leave that to you. Um, but what are some of the trends that you're thinking about at the moment? Well, certainly for the last several years, one of them is this whole thing about how bad acidity is. Mm. I think the way that you put it to me when we had a conversation recently, you said, I'm perplexed by the war on acidity (laughs) in coffee. That's exactly right. It it feels like a war. Um, So tell me about it. It started with cold brew. Uh Uh-huh. Using a method that was around even in the 70s when I first started. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, Toddy was right there at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, we were so sell- we did sell the coffee maker, uh, the cold mm-hmm. brew machine, but I didn't take it seriously. And nobody at that time did. To my mind, it was just amazingly dull coffee and being sold for health reasons, uh, low acidity and such, mm-hmm. which for some people may have real value. Right? Mm-hmm. No doubt about it. Um, but from an aesthetic point of view, what's really exciting that wasn't to me, right? And uh, all of a sudden, cold brew rears its head a few years ago, um, you know, and in seemingly nowhere. Uh, and it's all about the, the lower acidity that the coffee has and how sweet and, and easy it is to drink and, and so on. And um, my own theory goes, whether it's right or wrong, my, my theory goes that back in those days, just a few years ago, it was almost impossible to make a genuine iced coffee and do it properly. Uh, mm. I remember I was living in, in America at the time and I was perplexed by how bad all the cold brew was. Well, yeah, but I'm talking about iced coffee. Ice coffee. ice coffee was difficult, very mm-hmm. difficult to make because if you made a really great cup of black coffee, you put ice cubes in it, mm-hmm. it now became too diluted. Mm-hmm. So you didn't get the flavor. So you had to make a really strong cup of coffee mm-hmm. and that required less water and more coffee. And so now you under extracted mm-hmm. the coffee. So you couldn't really get the balance. And it became expensive, difficult, and not very successful for the most part. Uh, so, hey, now let's make some money easy uh, and let's do cold brew. No problem. <laughs> you're making an extract, you're doing cold water, you simplify it right down to bare bones. You've got your cold brew. And, uh, and yeah, and it's lower acidity on top of that. So now you push the whole lower acidity fact you can make it pretty strong because you're starting with an extract to begin with it's sitting in there 12 hours or more 24 hours etc um and and of course some of those machines are gorgeous they're the most beautiful coffee makers right. you've ever seen in your life <laughs> more toys chemistry right? set wow <laughs> right so all of that plays into this and a blue bottle really when you went to the original blue bottle you saw mm-hmm. this amazing chinese or certainly asian st- structures that were beautiful mm-hmm. um but uh, so that's taken off um but this whole battle on on acidity keeps coming and coming and coming and um do you it think- may also be partially involved with that back with cup of excellence and, and, and with um, lighter roast becoming a trend earlier Mm -hmm. on in 2000, 2010 and so on. Uh, Many roasters were roasting too light. Right. Uh, And 
and not enough body, uh, it's very difficult to roast right. It is extremely difficult. Uh, you know, and you can have roasted for many, many years, change the machine, and it's a challenge to come back right. uh, to getting it right. I don't. I don't see the science. I don't see it as a real science yet by any stretch. Right? Oh, we've got a very long way to go before roasting is a science. It's so much so, right. So you're dealing with a lot of kind of thin and vinegary drinks. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, um, you know, the, the type of water you're drinking, the, the making the brew with really can count for something as oh, well. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. coffee that tastes good in one place may not taste so good in another. Um, all of this played into it too. Uh, so you take a coffee sometimes and made strong and too lightly roasted and go, you, that's too acidic. Yeah, I could do that too, right? Mm. But do that's like making a lemonade without enough sugar. Well, and, and that's where I wonder... At the time, I was living in San Diego and I was watching this whole boom of yeah. of, of cold brew. And I also at the time was launching Elixir, specialty yes. coffee. Right. And so what was really interesting was to track who was driving this boom. Was it consumers or was it cafes? Because there was mm. an economic uh, advantage to you driving sure? cold brew, right? Uh, yes. It was oh, huge. That's huge. what I'm saying, right? Exactly. Right. Do you think that, first of all, do you think it was being pushed by cafes or consumers? And second of all, do you think? Oh, by, that, by roasters, by roasters right. and cafes, for sure. Right. Without a doubt, right. <clears throat> yeah. Because of all the easiness that came with it. It was cheaper, right. it was easier, it was faster, it was all of the things. And very reproducible. Right. Um, very predictable. Uh, and, uh, you know, it wasn't going to bother anybody. It was nothing ag aggressive or negative about it that way. It was well, and I, I wonder if the lack, I wonder if the lack of acidity in the drink made it was a a part of what made it fly, is because oh, it yes. wasn't aggressive. But also the popularity of cold drinks in general, iced drinks, right, goes hand in hand, right. So right, um, you know now, you know. In the last about, God, I guess it was four or five years ago now, mm -hmm. uh, a gentleman by the name of David Dussault here in Boston mm -hmm. uh, started making what is now called Snap Chill. Coffee. Right. Yes. Yeah. As this machine, and you take really hot coffee just brewed uh, and you just pour it through. And, you know, one minute later, you have a whole cup of coffee that is 38 degrees Fahrenheit or near freezing. Mm -hmm. uh, and since it was a perfect brew, it's a perfect iced coffee, right? Right. You, I like putting a, an ice cube in there or something like that because the very slight dilution is sort of like a whiskey or something like that, that with a little bit of water opens it. Beautiful. Kind of interesting. Very. Right? Um, and it can be incredibly and naturally, 100% naturally sweet. In fact, sweeter tasting cold, like iced coffee, yeah. than the hot beverage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, do you think, how do, how do we bring it back? Like, how important is it that we recalibrate the conversation around acidity in coffee? Oh, it's very important. It wine. really is. Uh, it's like wine. Imagine a wine that is, has no acidity at all. So it contributes to the balance of, in the cup. 100%. Exactly. It really, it has to be both. It's like fruit. A strawberry without acidity is just beautiful. Blech. Beautiful. <laughs> right. So, so when it comes to the, tr to uh, some of the other trends in coffee, what, what are some of the other trends that you've been paying attention to? Uh, that one has been the major one. It's certainly the one that I've been most most aware mm -hmm. of. Yeah, the other one now is definitely making very fancy drinks. Okay. Right. Well, hold on. This is Mixology. interesting coming from the Frappuccino. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No. It's, <laughs> the Frappuccino. I, I, what I like to say, it's true. What I like to say, though, is, is that you may be 
an absolute lover of black coffee, but your date may want the most amazing, <laughs> right? And since right. I really want you to come in for that black coffee, right. by I'm all happy. means, I'm going to make that date so happy. <laughs> That's the way. And I I'm going to maybe right. offer her a drink of my and it my pays the bills, right? <laughs> it pays the bills, right. and that's we're all you know we're in the business. We have to survive and hopefully thrive, right? In order to put out the next message or do or whatever we feel we need to right. do. Uh, and yeah, so frappuccino was great. And, and again, signature that was, drinks. So and again. that was not invented by me either. Right. Who invented it? But it was sold with um, with your coffee, with your oh, cafes, yeah. right? Yeah, but it has, a, again, it was being written about, and I remember it was actually, the, I believe it was the director of the SCAA, Ted Lingle, who was okay. writing about iced cappuccino back in the early 80s. Okay. Right? And I was reading about that, but I didn't really know how to go about it or anything else, right. but I kept that in my mind as being, wow, that could really sell in my yeah. cafes, right? Uh, and then when uh, Schultz took over Starbucks and I said, I've got to find out what this guy's doing, uh, you know, because mm -hmm. sooner or later he's going to be in my backyard because he yeah. said he was going national. Uh, so I went to Seattle and I met there uh, someone who, I wish I could remember his name, it was really, again, just such a help. And he just very generously drove me around to various cafes, including his own that he had in the suburb there. Uh, and we came to an espresso place mm -hmm. um, that Starbucks later purchased, right? I can't remember the name of right now. It could come to me. But in any case, and they were serving iced cappuccino in a granita machine. Wow. There it was. And I tasted it and it was delicious, very sweet. Yep. That's what you want. It to taste creamy, like delicious. A dessert. Like, yeah. Right there. Uh, and so I came back uh, and it was basically coffee, sugar, uh, milk. And milk. Right. That's it. The three ingredients. And uh, I gave it to my my marketing and he had been a manager of one of my cafes, uh, Andrew Frank, and said, make this Get, get this right, yep. right? And we need a name. And he came up with the name Frappuccino. Wow. Right? Northeast, Frapp, I guess is, as he said, it was an origin. The name mm -hmm. came from there. Uh, and there it was, Frappuccino. So we named it Frappuccino. And then, um, and then Starbucks actually, what they really bought was the name and a beverage very similar to ours, but it was also adding cocoa. Ah, uh, so like a mocha. Well as coffee. Uh, and it was done in a blender mm. to give it that handmade illusion. <laughs> right. Uh, I and, love you, and of course, that would be instrumental because now you can, I mean, look at the different kinds of frappuccino they're mm. serving at Starbucks. It's it's a teenager's dream. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> Everything uh, under everybody's the sun. <laughs> buying them, and it's and the, the the rest is history because the whole brand ended up being built off it. Like right. Starbucks is built off that, and yeah. it can this next yeah. generation continues to love that. So, we are about to have the conversation. I'm very very excited about having in the next episode, folks. We are going to talk about pricing oh, and oh, economics. One, wait a minute. One Go other ahead. thing is yes. blends. I'm hearing blends a lot now. That's okay. the other, tell, much more recent. Okay. Yeah. Tell tell us about that just quickly well, before we get into that. Well, suddenly that's become the rage among some some people, not everybody by any means, right? But okay. I'm starting to see this conversation happening on Facebook and, uh, you know, other platforms. Right? About creating blends. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow, blends. I love blends because you can make this and that and so on. So it's... One, it's putting the the, um, the the light on the roaster manufacturer instead of the producer away from the farmer, one hundred percent. Because now the farmer's put back in the role of just providing an ingredient and could be replaced anytime with another farmer. Interestingly, right. uh, we have been having this debate recently um, in amongst uh, a a client of mine and uh, another consultant 
Because in the Middle East, nobody sells blends. Mm. Interesting. Okay. And in fact, they oh. look down on oh, good for a, them. Uh, any roasting company that yep. sells blends. And that is consumer driven. Consumers won't buy blends. This is it. It's a culture that's already, but the, the culture you're talking about is one that's really ancient. Right, but but also they yeah. benefit. Their starting point in specialty coffee uh-huh. is after yeah. our 50 years of building yeah. specialty coffee, which is why I'm so excited about the region because, yeah. we, you know, when I started in coffee, there were natural and washed coffees. And then a few years later, honey processing came along and then we moved into all the different kinds of processing methods and now we've arrived at all these fancy ultra. Just, that's another trend, right? Right. And that's another one that is very <laughs> worrisome to me. Right. But that's their starting point, right? So because their starting point is so intricate and quite ornate in yeah. its offerings, they have a whole di- different way of approaching specialty coffee as a base minimum for them than what we had to evolve through, which is why I think it is the most exciting coffee uh, consuming region in the world because it's led by them. don't add anything into it, cardamom, on and on and on. Well, well, traditionally Arabic coffee is is, uh, served with all of those uh, different spices and those – but – Arabic coffee is a completely different beverage than espresso yes. or then yes. the, and over there they offer V60s which is the most popular drink over there. I it's had a, the privilege to mm-hmm. have several people from Saudi Arabia who were studying in Boston. Beautiful. Actually prepare the drink which is completely transparent. Yeah. It doesn't look like coffee, right? It's served out of a very different looking yeah. server as well. Right. Yeah, right. and it was extraordinary. It's a yeah. completely different world. Super light roast. Well, really in Saudi Arabia roast. it is. But if you drink it from yeah. where my family are from, Syria, yeah. it's actually quite a dark roast. It gets darker the further away the further, you go. Correct, from, correct. And so that, all right. of these things are very exciting. But in amongst that, yeah. um, what you have is this incredibly fast evolving coffee consuming, specialty coffee consuming um, kind of culture where the consumer are taking SCA courses so that they can understand exactly how to drink coffee. They they hold baristas accountable. It's really just fantastically wild. So going back to the blends thing, we were speaking to some clients over there and saying how having blends would actually make it more affordable for you to enter the market. And I, I brought a consultant in from over there to talk to me about that and he said, you have to kill the idea because blends will not work here. A roaster interesting. will not. So, I mean, that's a little bit of that's hope for you. Very interesting. I had no idea. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. So that's great. But you know, I, this whole thing with blending uh, really starts when the price of coffee goes through the roof two years ago. Right. Brazil. Right. Nothing. Not before. So it's, it's, it's the story of survival. And Which we're about to see you, again, yeah. I think. With, that's, the, that's with the, the way the econ- economics is going, I think we're about exactly, to see some right. very interesting things happen. Yeah, a Which, lot of people in the business want to see the price of coffee being lower, and that's how you do it. I mean, coffee's cyclical. Uh, hold on. We're having the conversation we should be having in the next episode. <laughs> so oh. let's <laughs> join us in the next episode, <laughs> folks. We're going to talk about the pricing and economics of coffee. But it it hey. is the trend for blending. Right. It, uh, 100%. That's, that's the- and, and the two, the, the two are connected. Right. right. And then the final trend that I do want to bring up is what we've seen with Cup of Excellence and other um, and other uh, uh, competitions and auctions. Right. Uh-huh. Is this race towards manufacturing a drink from coffee and Give me taking an example. it further and further away from what it tastes like originally. 
Um, and like. you know, you start with a carbonic maceration mm -hmm. and you're going towards kombucha like flavors mm -hmm. uh, and taking them to radically different things than what you would do. If you're a farmer, really doing everything you can to, to grow the, the best variety perfectly and then process it ripe and so on to produce this amazingly sweet thing, you, you're getting paid a pittance compared to somebody who's got this, the resources to start doing all these other things and doing a much smaller batch that already has nothing to do with the coffee itself and, and what that plant produced to a large degree. It's completely changed uh, from my point of view. And many people in the industry, many of them, including many who sell this stuff, uh, can drink it, but they all say, I can't drink it every day. No, nor can you really drink a whole cup. It's not an everyday coffee. It's it, Yeah, it's... Um, it's very narrow and I don't find it complex. I find it very one noted, right? And right. I do find that carbonic maceration, funnily enough, uh, is in wine, it's Beaujolais Nouveau, which is not exactly a high price coffee. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, you know, and it has, it's, it's celebrating how fresh that that wine is, it's absolutely brand new, mm -hmm. you know, just produced, uh, and it has a kind of bubblegum note to it. So do you sell any of these coffees in We Georgia? sell a little bit. We sell a little okay. bit. How right? popular but are they? Not, not very, I'm happy to oh, say. Oh, wow. <laughs> but I do wonder. Uh, again, Americans almost just about in the beginning, with a few exceptions, don't bother with the competitions. They don't do the auctions. Mm. You know, it's the reverse there, right, mm. for me. Mm. It's, they don't want to spend the money. It's still the old 25 cents thing yep. to a large degree. Um, you know, and why should they pay 25 or $50 a pound mm. for a straight out, well-processed, washed coffee right right where nothing super has been done to it uh, they just don't right you know i would call people different different roasters around the country and say hey i really love the number two coffee you know or the number three coffee uh would you but i can't afford to buy all of it but the three of us or the four of us can can buy it together mm -hmm. and what would you willing to go to well the most I've heard is like you typically $15 a pound. Mm -hmm. No, I'm sorry, 50, you know, whatever it takes to a large degree, because yeah, it's not 50 times better or a hundred, you know, whatever it is than another coffee, but you're doing it in order to, to, to really encourage and to reward the farmer for their effort. Right. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a way of, of heightening what they do. Um, and it also drives people then towards, uh, towards really producing high quality, which to my mind, whether I'm right or wrong, I don't know, but to my mind involves a lot of redundancy, which is not necessarily economic. And, right. and that's where I was about to say, now we're getting into the economics of decision-making and running businesses, which we Kenya, both, go on. Kenya is so perfect because it has so many redundancies in it. Mm. And as we cut those redundancies out because it's not efficient, mm. right? We may be losing it. And you know, from a manufacturing point of view, you think about Deming in Japan and Toyota and all those American all those Japanese cars that came in and blew away the American industry mm -hmm. decades ago. And it was part of it was redundancy. Okay. In the systems. This is this really is the perfect place for us to start talking about economics. So we're going to head into the yeah. next episode, folks. Join us for our next conversation, which is the pricing and the economics of coffee. Peace, love, and peanut butter. Have an amazing rest of your day. <laughs> and great coffee. <laughs> and great coffee. <laughs>
Thanks for tuning in, friends. There are two ways you can support this podcast. Firstly, become a paid member of our YouTube channel. Secondly, you can join our Patreon for as little as $3 a month. Don't forget to subscribe and like this video before you leave and check the show notes for more information. Now, this is what you should check out next.